Hello and welcome to The Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Doc Podcast. I have the pleasure of being joined today by a very impressive colleague, Dr. Daniel Clower. Just to give you a bit of background into who Daniel is, he attended college at Notre Dame, where he was on the varsity golf team, and then went on to obtain his DDS from The Ohio State University, where he met his wife, Haley. In 2010, they settled in South Bend, Indiana, where he began his professional journey. And now, 14 years later, he has two successful practices and, even more impressively, five, yes, five children. Uh, Daniel, he is the clinic director of the TMJ and Sleep Therapy Center with offices located in South Bend and Fort Wayne, Indiana. We'll be talking much more about his practices as well as to very important and often controversial areas in the field of dentistry, TMD and airway, throughout today's episode. Daniel's a diplomat of the American Board of Craniofacial Pain, the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, and the American Board of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine. He also published a book in 2018 titled Achieve Your Victory, Solutions for TMD and Sleep Apnea. I'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes for today's episode. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Daniel Clower to the Doc Podcast. Welcome, Daniel. Uh, Thanks for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. And I say, if anybody wants a copy of the book, get your contact info to Mike and we'll ship you out a copy as uh, it's just our way of educating doctors and patients about what we do and what opportunities are out there for you. So I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Mike and a little perk to listening to your show. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate you doing that. It's kind of you. Um, So I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this. We We're introduced through a friend. That's kind of the cool thing about one of the very cool things about what I'm doing now is you talk to one person and they know another person. And um, it's interesting that the the network of people who are kind of like minded in this arena of of pushing the envelope of what's possible. um, It's a it's a kind of a big circle, but a very tight knit circle and small in a lot of ways, too. And and you talk to one person like, oh, I didn't know so and so. And uh, as I'm newer, I would say in this arena than a lot of you, I'm starting to um, get a little more familiar with people's names, but yours had come up multiple times. And uh, we have a lot of common friends we found out and people that we that we know. So uh, speaking of that, you when we were talking, you'd mentioned um, I'd had Trevor Nichols on recently and and you know him and with him with four kids and you with five. I don't feel I'm doing my part here with two. I mean, good for you guys. How do you manage having five kiddos and what are their ages? 11, 10, 8, 6 and uh, 3. So we got basically 11 to 3 and they're all about 22 months apart or so. So it's uh. Yeah, it's busy, but you know, uh, a patient said to me once, "You got a hundred percent to give, and it's just divvied up upon your responsibilities." So, mm-hmm. um, I, most of the um, accolades go to my wife, who uh, you know manages everything, works part time as a uh, she teaches dental hygiene at the university. Oh, cool! And, um, and so, uh, yeah, we just you know have a good team at the office and a good team at home. So. That's great. Yeah, I, I can relate. Having a, a team and a Trev and I talked a lot about that, but having a spouse and that's there for you and able to balance that side of it is yeah. is really fun. And the kids are so fun and, and you're at fun, they're fun ages. And as mine are getting later and one's heading off to college here in the next couple of months, um, it's 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 really exciting to every stage of their life. But yeah. yeah, enjoy it and and enjoy the, the time with them. Um it's cliche that people say it goes fast and it really uh, isn't when you're in it. Kind of where you are, I remember thinking they seem like they're going to kind of be young for a long time, and then all of a sudden they're these young adults, yeah, and you're yeah, looking yeah. at them saying, "My gosh, they're they're heading out." So um, that's great. Well, congrats on that. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how you built everything. Um, you know, we have you had a pretty interesting journey, and I think. Uh, it's really important to get out there a lot, especially teaching residents as I do and, and being in touch with a lot of young doctors. There's a lot of confusion, apprehension, anxiety, understandably so, with starting out and what you do. And this is whether you're a general pract- in general practice, a specialist, how you start, where you start, what you do. And I often tell them, what you, it's, it's a journey. It's not like you have to literally pick that place, that spot right away. And, and you, yeah. I think you're a good example of a, a journey that you're still on. So if you could tell us a little bit more about, about your journey up to this point. Yeah. You know, I think a lot stems back to um, my father's a physician and 
when he did his training at Mayo Clinic, what he really liked was um, they had a uh, um, a mentor uh, at every stage, and it was a mentor where they they met with shirt tie sit down and there was a mentee mentor relationship right from the start and that that formal process um really solidified his journey through medicine um he did internal medicine and then physical medicine rehab uh and so right away he he kind of said you know find that mentor in your uh um in your career and um you know at school they, they give you you know, an advisor, faculty advisory or whatever, mm-hmm. but, but really like kind of more at that personal level of, of, um, of mentorship. So as I got into dentistry, um, the first job I had kind of first clinical mentor, um, busy general practice, um, you know, 12 ops, one doctor ability to grow fee for service. And so I started working for him, my junior year in college and then every break at dental school oh, cool. break, summer break, I'd take out the trash, run the statum, you know, help chair side assist. And then in dental school, I built his first website, um, on the <laughs> site, build <it.com>. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um, and there's a great website called the Wayback machine. Wow. You can look up any website back in time it indexes no way yeah so that's it, pretty cool you, you can go back and look at your website like your old practice website yeah oh, i'd love to yeah you, yeah because when i started it. in early 2000s i was like yeah. one of the first people yeah. in my whole area that had even had a web yeah. I mean, and we people could, listening like what but yeah we didn't really people didn't really have websites back so then. we could probably find a funny picture of you on it oh even. i'm sure yeah so so yeah waybackmachine.com is kind of cool okay. and so anyways built that through um dental school and then joined him right after after. had a brief moment where I thought about doing oral surgery. I did some surgical externships for three weeks at uh, Parkland, Dallas and mm-hmm. uh, Shreveport. Mm-hmm. So got really good exposure, exposure in surgery. And that was probably my favorite thing, like taking out teeth and, mm. and doing that stuff. Um, so then fast forward, I was, you know, two, three, about, yeah, just coming up to two and a half years into practice. We were buying an ICAT and, um, you know, in, included in the $160,000 purchase was a weekend course mm-hmm. in Denver. And um, so my boss at mentor at the time, he went to the course, I stayed back and worked. And he heard a lecture from Dr. Stephen Olmos on craniofacial pain and sleep. And he signed me up for his mini residency. I remember I was at dinner, he called me and he said, Hey, uh, this was November. And he, he rarely calls me after hours. So, and I, I was man in the office while he was gone. So I stepped out of dinner. I remember we were at a restaurant called Villa McCree and uh, I stepped out and I was like, Hey, what's up? And he goes, Hey, do you have a second? I was like, yeah, what's going on? Hey, I, I need to know if you're free these weekends. And, um, then he gave me the weekends and he goes, just let me know. And I said, okay. So I, I, te- I texted him. I said, yep, free those weekends. And that was it. I was kind of like, what's he talking about? So he came back, he put a flyer on my desk and he said, Hey, I signed you up for this mini residency. It's in TMJ and sleep. I think after you take this course, you could end up doing this full time if you want. Hmm. And I was like, well, okay, I'll go to the course, but you're, you're crazy. Like, <laughs> I can do this full time. I, I'd taken one like weekend Somnomed course with, oh God, I remember who it was, but just kind of like a weekend free, you know, whatever. And so I dabbled, I'd done a couple of appliances, probably is probably like the average guy, a patient asks you to make it and you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'll try. Yep. Um, ended up remaking all of those appliances, <laughs> but, um, um, took the course January, we learned how to screen people. So we screened people February. I learned how to do a full workup and exam. So I started examining people. And then in March, we learned how to take records, take a bite and put together a treatment plan. So I started my first case in March and ironically yesterday, uh, one of my patients was in of 11 years. She was the first case I treated, but was also my board patient that I said, no way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, Rose was in yesterday. That's Um, and, um, yeah, 11 years later, her TM joint stable, healthy. She wears an orthotic bite hasn't changed. She feels really good. Things are, things are stable in regards to the jaw joint. But anyways, so that was, March started doing cases and um, June 1st stopped doing general dentistry and mm-hmm. just did TMJ and sleep. So June 1st of 2013 stopped doing that and just jumped into 
um, you know, craniofacial facial pain, sleep, migraine, snoring, and sleep and um, snoring and sleep apnea and stuff. So then um, in 16, moved into a 2,500 square foot facility, um, kind of maxed out that over five years. And then January of 22, we moved into current office, you know, 10,000 square feet, um, kind of an education seminar, community room, mm, neat. Uh, staff lounge and, um, you know, stuff. So we have a um, bunch of room and have four different providers here now. And and so wasn't very intentional, like meaning I never had like a keen interest in it, but mm. um, I developed one. And then, you know, about a year in, it was like, oh, cool. This is what I was meant to be. So what you said at the beginning, you know, you don't have to have a pre-programmed journey. Um, it came to it. So I found a clinical mentor in, um, uh, in TMJ and sleep. And then um, well, those are all pivotal, probably like one of the most, one of the most, uh, outside of dentistry mentors working with, uh, now a good friend, Scott Manning. And I, you know, I meet with him once a quarter, um, over a weekend out of town. And I've been doing that for eight years now. And, and what that, type of, of things does he help with? So it really, he's, he's like life mindset, um, winning patient influence, um, really, really letting people see your passion, mm. abundance mindset, um, wealth strategy, mm -hmm. um, practice, uh, practice strategy. So really like he, he hits the gamut, you know, okay. first and foremost marriage, uh, happiness, kids, family, mm -hmm. if that's not great. Not, and nothing else matters and everything else suffers. Yep. Um, to down to, Hey, we're hiring. We look at this job post. And oh, so, interesting. Wow. That is, that's a broad, yeah, that's, that's a, yeah, a broad he's spectrum. A, he's a sage. Um, he'd be great to have on your show. Um, yeah, I'll definitely make, make a, the knowledge, but yeah. he, he's been that mentor, um, on that realm that, that I've had with consistency. So I think my, my dad's advice of finding a mentor coach person that gets to know you can push you, accelerate you mm. is, is really the key. And, you know, you've heard this, you know, Michael Jordan had a coach, Wayne mm -hmm. Gretzky had a coach. So, um, uh, not comparing myself to those two guys, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, you no, understood if, if the best of the greatest yeah. of the greats still need yeah. coaching. Yeah. yeah. Then, then us working our way up on these things and, yeah. and they credit their coaches publicly for yeah. even at the yeah. peak of their career, pushing them to be even better. Um, and, just, and, you know, everybody's different. Like, you know, Jordan, for instance, he says he, he sucks as a coach, right? Mm. He, he, he doesn't have the patience, the skill. Yep. And that. so, you know, there, there's people who are, um, you know, their skills will shine and, and it's, it's obvious by the content they deliver and stuff. And, and then obviously, as you know, when you, when you do something you love and you're passionate about, yes, it's work, but it's fun work and it's, we all need to work. So, um, so yeah, so that's been, that's been a big part of the journey over the years and really helped us solidify, uh, where I am and give me the confidence that I feel like I'm going in a good place and, and really pleased with it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to come back to talking in some more detail, uh, cause I want to hear a lot more about the practice and the design of it and, and what you guys do and how you do it. But I think there's probably a lot of people out there thinking, okay, you decided to go focus on some of the things that give most practitioners the biggest headache. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, to just throw that out there now, like talk a little bit about, I'm sure you hear yeah. that a lot of that. What, what is it that in that, I guess, number one, why did you in just those few months of being exposed, obviously something in you was really attracted to this. Yeah. But what was that? Number one. And number two, how did you know that you were going to thrive in that area at that time? I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's episode, Retainers for Life. We all know how stressful in-house retainer fabrication and replacement can be, especially during those busy summer months. And that's why you need to check out Retainers for Life. Retainers for Life is an affordable and convenient retainer replacement program that not only fabricates custom retainers for your patients, but they actually deliver the new retainers directly to your patient's doorstep and the best part is that you, the doctor, get to maintain control over the retainer design and material, set your own fees, and generate additional revenue for your practice. Plus, as a very satisfied customer of Retainers for Life, I can honestly say that the entire team is truly amazing and will be there to assist you and your team from onboarding to implementation. 
So go to AfterOrthoRevenue.com and schedule to book a discovery call now with a Retainers for Life team member. And be sure to use my exclusive discount code DOC2024 to get $2,500 off your enrollment fee. Again, that's AfterOrthoRevenue.com. Use my exclusive discount code DOC2024 to get $2,500 off your enrollment fee. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. Yeah, you know, so um, I think a uh, skill set I've always had is um, communication. Uh, some people say I talk too much, but I I think that I truly have um, you know have an interest and ability to connect with people and um, figure out how I can serve. So I'm, I'm tend to be the one uh, always connecting people with no tangible benefit to myself and industries just because of. I think they'd get along, so mm-hmm. I'll put them in touch, and then I'll see them doing great things, and it gives me peace and comfort. It's like, oh, cool, glad glad they have a, had a synergy. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I always kind of find myself doing that through school and and you know first jobs and things like that. So d- um, dentistry can be very um, transactional, operational, and um, and I, I I liked it, I loved it. Um, but I, I really, looking back, I needed more of a um, coaching guide, overall health guidance pathway in my my doctor patient care. Oh, interesting. And, okay, okay. You yeah. kind of have that with the TMJ because, you know, yesterday I had a patient. You know, headaches came out of nowhere. She was, you know, five years into doing great, and I said, you know. Jeannie, I got to ask what, what, what's new. I mean, you got this, this, she goes, nothing. I said, something had to have changed because your jaw's fine. This is fine. But you said you had the first migraine in five years. Um, you know, and then she got teary, opened up divorce, kid going through tough stuff, mm. you know, all of this stuff. And it's like, okay, cool. We had a great 25 minute conversation, got her some names of a therapist, mm. hadn't really associated that with any of her problems. And we'll follow up with her in a couple of weeks. So now I'm like off the spectrum treating her TMJ problem, but mm. we're there to guide her and, and get her in front of the right practitioners. And, you know, sad thing is she'd been to her physician for three different mm. medications already for the migraines mm. and which Mia may help, but like until she addresses that stuff head on, she's not going to get better. So, the, and that's, and it's I started for a second, but that is such yeah. an important point. And Number one, kudos to you for for caring enough to do that. Um, and I see our profession, dentistry specialists, and this is something I talk about all the time that I'm so passionate about. We have the ability to find and detect these things in ways that our medical colleagues don't. Yeah. Whether it's just the system, whether I, you know, again, I, I don't, it's above my pay grade to know the exact reasons why, but I know that we have an ability as dental practitioners to get to know these patients. We have a continuum. We see them more repeatedly over a continuum of time, especially the kiddos, which we'll get to them in a little bit on the airway side of things. And that's one of the reasons with the AAO, why I get so passionate about and frustrated with their 2019 white paper that punts everything back essentially for, to the pediatrician and to the physician and says, you just tell us what to do because yeah. I'm not indicting the medic, my, our medical colleagues. I, I don't think I could, I'm not even saying I could do it better or differently if I was in their shoes, but the system is not letting them. Anybody who's been to the physician themselves or has family members who have struggled with any health issues or has kids uh, that have been going through anything, you know, it's a battle to try to get the physicians to pay attention. And a lot of times, exactly what you just said happens. They throw a medication at them. They want to treat the yeah. symptoms and they're not looking at the etiology. And I maybe part of it too is, is in the dental profession. I do feel we're really trained more in an etiological mindset. We, we try to get yeah. at the causes of these things. And then you take some with your personality who loves that almost therapy side of things, right? And the getting yeah. to know the people and helping them and the passion for helping them. And I mean, that's a, a that's a game-changing, life-changing thing you just did for her. And I think it's so important for our listeners to hear, especially the young docs, or maybe even more senior docs who are just kind of bored and tired of the day-to-day grind of dentistry, which it obviously can be, that there's so much we can do with our skill set yeah. out there to change people's lives. And what what's frustrating is... Um, my dad says um, with the onset of managed care in the eighties, physicians signed over 
they passed the baton to the insurance company and they gave insurance the right to practice medicine without a license. Mm -hmm. And that's what's led to 15 minute appointments. It takes time to listen. Mm -hmm. And um, if they have to ask the CMS questions of how many steps you have in your house and how many bowel movements you have a day and this and that, by the time they fill out their required documentation to get it covered, when a patient says, doc, my shoulder's been bugging you. Oh, we'll go see a specialist. Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe they'd find out they're, they're sleeping like this. And the physician be like, Hey, why don't you alter your sleep position and then mm -hmm. get back in and let me know if it goes away as opposed to my shoulder hurts. Oh, we can inject it. It's yep. like, well, maybe, again, maybe that might be needed. So to the physician's defense and the dentist defense who are, who are heavily in network and not getting paid their worth. Um, if they want the lights to stay on, they got 15 minutes. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's a dentist who made a great post of, he published it in the paper for his patients to see. He did a surgical extraction on a type two diabetic um, with acute pain and he got reimbursed $67. Oh. And I think he showed the receipt of that same patient, got her hair done for $450 in an hour. And he's mm -hmm. like, I think the stylist deserves that for sure. Go mm -hmm. good for her, but I'm not, I'm done doing these risky procedures. Yep compensation that's penny on the dollar pennies yeah. on the dollars so i think to to the defense of uh dentists and physicians like you know you 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 force them to work with one hand tied behind their back that's the results that we're going to get yep. and it's that yep yeah and it's great that you're willing to step outside of that and saw that you know you saw earlier than a lot do that you wait a minute i'm not loving the mechanical nature of this and and i think yeah. i could go in a different direction so how has that journey been what have been some of the challenges you faced? I'm not in on like the practice management side and all that at this point, but just kind of on the patient management side and doing something that isn't typically done. You know, there's not, a, I don't know the numbers, maybe you do of the, the number of people who, who kind of subspecialize or focus on yeah. these areas like TMD and sleep, but it's certainly not, you don't have, I imagine this huge group of colleagues to commiserate yeah. with and, and learn from. So what but, have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced? Um, yeah, there's probably, I don't know, I, I don't know but 50 to 75 docs doing it full time, doing it full time, not doing general dentistry. Um, and majority of the um, AAOP or ABOP specialists are um, academic. Mm -hmm. So they're teaching in the school and they're in the mm -hmm. program. So there's more with that. But um, so, yeah, there's not a huge, there's a lot of people that do it, offer it, maybe have set days. It's part of their general practice. Um but there's, yeah, there's not a ton that do it full time, all in, nothing else. Uh, so I, I think initially some of the biggest challenges were um, um, unlearning the stuff we were taught in dental school. That what do you, what do you mean by that? I, I love that. I want to hear more um, about that. It's normal for kids to brux; they grow out of it. That's mm -hmm. like the biggest farce. Um, and there's tons of literature to support that. Um, Christian Gimino. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Dr. David Gazal, Gazals, yep. mm -hmm. um, tons of, tons of people, uh, Gilles Levy, um, great published articles on that. So it's, it's not true. Um, take your dentures out at night, maybe, but if they have apnea, it's making your apnea worse. Um, uh, mesial drift, like our teeth have memory and they're going to move measly over time. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's our breathing suffers over time. Our tongue rests low and our muscles push our teeth. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the book chapter in in contemporary orthodontics by mm -hmm. dr fields who's a ohio state guy um in the book it says respiratory patterns are the primary determinant of the position of the teeth jaw tongue and head itself mm -hmm. so why is every orthodontist not talking about the etiology of crooked teeth thank you so when i get can you, can you can, i want to reset yeah why is every orthodontist not yeah. talking about the etiology of crooked teeth? Thank yeah. you. And I, I show patients that book and I say, which is biblical. Like, it, it's a biblical book yeah. tech text in, in the orthodontic and pediatric dental arena. Yeah. It is like the book you learn. Every dentist out there has, has read it. from and yeah. taken exams on the contents mm -hmm. of profit fields and the articles therein in and of, of profits, contemporary orthodontics. Yeah. yeah. And we, uh, um, we I have that book. And so a patient comes in, I'm treating like, hey, my my daughter saw um uh you know um you know Dr. Mike and then I saw Dr. John. 
for ortho. I was like, oh, what'd you think? Well, Dr. Mike was 8,000. Dr. John was five. And I said, oh, um, which one talked about why your kid's teeth are crooked? Oh, well, Dr. Dr. Uh, Mike talked about nasal breathing and tongue position. And um, I don't know, they, they, they want me to see your therapist during treatment. Um, but uh, the other was really endearing. He said it'd be really easy and, you know, $5,000. And I said, oh, okay. Um, do you get your teeth cleaned at your dentist? Oh, yeah, 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 I do. I was like, okay. Well, so your dentist cares about preventing disease and cares about why you get cavities and will educate you on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be inclined mm -hmm. to be with a provider that is talking about the etiology of the disease, mm -hmm. not just fixing the end stage. So, and I have a sheet I'll give the parents and I'll be like, just hey, get these questions answered and it'll be very clear who you should see. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so, you know, it, it'd be the equivalent of the college kid comes home, the dentist finds five cavities and never says a lick about diet, sugar, right, anything, right. just fixes the cavities. Like, right. That'd be negligence. That'd be yeah. supervised neglect. Yep. Uh, that'd be malpractice to, yep. to not at least have a conversation about, hey, Susie, are you drinking Red Bull every night type thing? And I'll take it a step further. A lot of my colleagues will, instead of not only just saying nothing about the etiology, they will actually argue that the etiology is- double down. So yeah. that would be like the general dentist saying it has nothing to do with what yeah, you yeah, eat. Yeah. What you're eating is completely irrelevant. Right. You have soft teeth or weak enamel or, you know, yeah. whatever it is. This is part of the aging process, whatever, you know, sort of hyperbolic uh, explanation they might give, but, but ultimately not looking at the true cause. And that's what frustrates me so yeah. much and why I'm so passionate about this and spend the time I do trying to teach it and get the message out. Yeah. And you've seen the AJ audio paper, all orthodontic cases relapse at seven years. Mm. They may maintain the inner canine width. I thought if you, I thought if we extracted teeth, that the teeth didn't relapse as much though. Is that, is that, <laughs> sorry, know, I, could, it, I couldn't it, resist. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it's, 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 you know, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of like the, um, <clears throat> the dentists who, um, I mean, I don't blame them. It's what, what we were taught. The dentists who say, oh, amalgam safe great, your six-year-old needs a filling, put an amalgam in. Oh, no, I'm not putting an amalgam in my kid. <laughs> right. And, and you know, we we tell a, a, a pregnant woman not to eat salmon because of the potential mercury in it, but we're good with metal. And they say, oh, amalgams don't leach. Come to my office and look at my the inside of my appliances. They're all gray mm -hmm. from the amalgam leaching. And so it doesn't mean every amalgam needs to come out. But, I mean, come on. We, we should be past the point that we're not using that material on the regular, but the industry is so committed to it. It's not to say um, um, we're moronic and not talking about airway and ortho practice, but you got some pretty severe cases. We, we do have a duty at least to offer to the patient good, better, or best. And, you know, we can, we can straighten the teeth. Uh, we can develop the arch or we can go all in and straighten the teeth, develop the arch and talk about preventing relapse. You know, how do you look at health and, and what's your priority? It's kind of like a type two diabetic. Like, do you want to take a drug the rest of your life and risk with kidney and liver disease, or do you want to change lifestyle and, uh, and, and cure your diet type two diabetes? Right. Um, and it really just depends on the individual and what they want. I tend to attract the patients that are more engaged in their care, want to actively participate and have a proactive outlook at health. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's fine. I mean, there's got to be providers for all types of patients. Um, but we can't assume someone doesn't want that. My dad said, um, and other people have said this, but I always remember him saying it. You can never care for a patient more than they're willing to care for themselves. However, you can educate them to increase their deserve and their care level. And mm -hmm. then you can keep matching them. Yep. And, and I think we find that happening a lot in our practice. A lot. Yep. Um, and, and I think people so, oftentimes try to, in the first part of trying to, they try to, I literally was just talking to the residents about this in a lecture yesterday. We try to force our will upon them mm -hmm. and get them to do or, or, or perform or behave in a way that is our belief system and our value system before they're ready to even comprehend it. Yeah. And we're like, well, if you don't want to take it the way I say it, then, then I'm not even going to entertain it. What you said and from the message from your dad and others that you just shared is, no, you can't push them past that initially, but using your knowledge and skill and communication skills, you can say, hey, look, this is where we're at. 
I'm going to work you through this and walk you through this and together. And I think a lot of that comes down to in the beginning, not rushing through everything as is kind of the common theme in, in the orthodontic office. A lot of what happens is in a lot of practices, they're just trying to really rush through the consultation diagnostic process. And I'm not saying they're neglecting. I'm not saying they're not taking the time to look at records. A lot of docs will do that in the background and let the treatment coordinator present the treatment plan. I use treatment coordinators in my practice heavily. I wasn't the one presenting the fees and going through, showing them how the appliances work. But I was the one that looked through all the images and, and did a clinic full clinical exam with every patient. And I presented the diagnosis and treatment plan always to every single patient and or parent. And I found it, it has a really, has two effects. One, uh, you're showing them that you're competent and understand and caring as a provider. And two, you're helping them understand what's actually going on with them and or their child so that they can make more educated, informed decisions. And I think when you just go in and are like, you just need you know, braces for X dollars or whatever it is, because you're concerned about that start or not losing them to another provider, or because you're just busy and you don't have a lot of time in that room, it's it becomes almost no different than the physicians who we were just talking about that yeah. only get 15 minutes in the room and they can't look at everything. So can, can you get lucky? And in 75, 80% of your cases as an orthodontist, may you be able to hit the hit the bullseye and do pretty well? Sure, maybe so. But there's that 20, 25% that you've totally missed what's actually going yeah. on. And those are the ones that end up two years later, keeping you up at night as an orthodontist, because <laughs> Trevor and I talked a lot about this. It's like, it's the cases you misdiagnosed that are the ones that typically 99% of the time come back to haunt you down the road. Um, yeah. It's not typically, you know, because you put a different wire in or, you know, what, whatever you, you, the elastic was on the different tooth. It's typically because you, you missed the, the diagnostic. So what you're saying, taking that extra time, finding out what the patient's concerns are and then creating a shared vision at the beginning of the process and then walking them through it yeah. is, is a, a way that you've succeeded with. So with that, what do you, what does your process look like? If you can kind of take us like, I'm a new patient, I walk in, yeah. um, I'm thinking I'm either having maybe some sleep issues or TMD issues or, or both kind of what's my process, even down to like the diagnostics, the imaging the just so people can kind of visualize what it's like to go through the journey at your practice. I'll take you the journey. I had a thought about ortho real quick. I wanted yeah. to ask you, yep. what's the average orthodontist case starts a year? Would you say? Uh, I like, think the AAO puts out, it's like 250-ish, I want to say, something like that. I think that's about average. I mean, okay. most, I mean, I was doing a fair amount more than that in my okay. my peak production years, but um, it kind of depends on how much. But I think most, if you take some you know, people are late in their career, they're not working full time. And I think it yeah. ends up in that mid twos range, okay. it, it would be my so, estimate based on what I've seen. So I look at myofunctional therapy, like the hygienist for a general practice, you know, mm-hmm. the hygienist. Some generate a lot of revenue for the practice, some service the people that generate the revenue on the restorative and, and there's a, you know, it's a necessity to the practice. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I have proposed, um, to younger orthodontists getting into this, I said, you need a myofunctional therapist and let's just say, hi, you want, you want myofunctional therapy to be a hundred, hundred thousand dollars in revenue a year. Um, that covers salary and materials and stuff associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you um, you add $400, 400 times 250 cases, yep. that covers it. Got it. Mm-hmm. Take your ortho fee, you add $400 to it. Add 1000 if you want, but mm-hmm. 400 And that basically self-funds it. Mm-hmm. And, and little Johnny comes in, you have the basic myofunctional exercises that you test them on, and really you can train an assistant to do it. And then when doc presents, you go, Hey, here's the case fee. And you know what? Um, when we see you for your first three checks, you're going to go right over into our myofunctional room and you're going to work with crystal mm-hmm. and crystal is going to make sure you graduate from the basics. Mm-hmm. And if she need, needs more time, she's going to have you come back. So basically in the ortho clinic, it's, it's check-in, see doctor, see myo, get scheduled out. Mm-hmm. And it's this role. Cause the tough part for me, when, our top referrals are orthodontists and they refer to our myofunctional therapists, which I love Mm -hmm. and and it's great, but now mom's got to take them out of school, got to coordinate it and this and that. And, and it'd be ideal to get it in the ortho. So if you're an aspiring hygienist SLP that wants to do myofunctional therapy, 
go find a busy orthodontic practice, show that model to them. And that's sustainable. You need mm -hmm. some supplies and stuff, but you just teach the dentist and the assistant how to screen. And then you'll just help enhance outcomes of these cases. And it really doesn't take any more doctor time. And it's such a unique add on and yeah. service. Uh, really, I never heard that proposed. That's a really interesting concept. I actually just had Nicole Goldfarb on. Um, oh, yeah. Her episode just, just launched recently. So, yeah. And she taught me a lot about that arena yeah. because as many of these things we're talking about, we don't learn any. I mean, yeah, yeah. I bet if you asked every graduating orthodontic resident, they were coming up on graduation now. I bet oh, if you right. pulled everyone in the country, what, what do you think? I mean, what would be your, and we're just guessing, but what would be your guess in the number that actually could tell you what myofunctional therapy even is? 5% tops. Yeah. I, I'd say tops. Yeah, I'd say and tops. I, I, and maybe I, only I, if they had like personal experiences. I don't know. I just. I, also like little Johnny's in, you know, his, his uh, up centrals aren't fully in and you're like, I don't want to put an expander on. I'd like to do it in four months, but they got symptoms. Hey, start with some myofunctional mm -hmm. therapy. You put a note in the chart to the therapist when the, when the ones and twos are fully erupted back on our schedule. So basically mm -hmm. you get the case started, you get the parent engaged, they get some of the symptoms under control and you start to work on the foundation before the aesthetics and you get, and that's the problem we run into is we get a lot of symptomatic five, six year olds who went to the orthodontist and they put on growth observation. Yeah. But mom's like, but we got all these symptoms right? and the allergies is keeping this. So it, it's, you know, I, I just, you know, Dr. Kevin Boyd, um, be another yeah. good guy for you to have. On. He's actually, we, we just, we literally just scheduled oh. it yesterday. For, oh, right. It'll cool. be coming, yeah. it'll be coming yeah. in, uh, in he, July. So he's great. He's great. <laughs> so, um, he, he said, you know, the moment you find out your kids need, needs glasses, you get them glasses. Mm -hmm. You don't wait till their head's fully grown. So you don't have to keep buying glasses. Right. So like if, so, if a kid needs three or four rounds of expansion, they need three or four rounds of expansion. Like, don't be apologetic for it, but why would you, that, that's the problem with the, my, my, uh, question with the AAO recommendation is, you know, uh, uh, eight is great. Nine is fine. It's like, okay, well, what if they have symptoms right. you just beat? and, right. and so, and their symptoms are all tooth related. It's like, oh, if it's a crossbite, we can start, but if it's yeah. not a crossbite, yeah. we can't. it's like, yeah, what does that make a difference on? No, that ex that's exactly it. Yeah. Problem. Yeah. Teeth problem. Yep. So anyways, that, that's a, that's a thought came to mind with like the ortho side. And I joke with, I told my local orthodontist this, I joke as like, um, as much as you think I wouldn't want you to do that because you refer to us, it actually would elevate everybody in the area. Mm. And guess what? Those severe cases, you're going to see more of them and you're going to send them over to us. So it's, it's, it's a win-win. Um, mm -hmm. you just, I don't want you hijacking my therapist. That, <laughs> right, that's gotta be that. on me. I gotta make sure <laughs> I make a great work environment that you would never want to leave. Um, so anyways, um, to that, but yeah, the journey of a patient. So, um, so right now there's, there's three pathways in our practice to get, to get in, if you will. Um, we take referrals from specialists and, and so I'd say about, uh, 85% uh, come from physicians or dentists. And then the other 15 is Google, you know, friends and family, but very, very often, um, patient will say, um, what brought you in, uh, Dr. Smith? Okay. Well, how'd that come up? Oh, well, I was in there. I told my jaw hurt and hurt and I Googled you and I asked if I could get a referral and they said, sure. Mm -hmm. So really Dr. Smith didn't refer. Google did, but Dr. Smith knows I exist and at least didn't mm -hmm. say anything negative. So mm -hmm. on the game, so it's a loose number for sure. Um, so the, the, the three people that do well, really it's four, actually the, the four people that do new patient exams in the practice are me and the nurse practitioner. So her and I will see new patients on um, TMJ, sleep, snoring, headaches, migraines, um, stuff. Dr. Cantieri, our, our uh, musculoskeletal rehab physician, mm -hmm. he sees people for chronic neck, shoulder, back, hip, knee pain. And, mm -hmm. and what's really awesome about him is he sees a lot of neck pain and he'll make a lot of referrals for them to get their nose fixed, to get mm -hmm. their right. So breathing related, again, before, etiology. Yep. Before he'll start doing injections on the neck. He's like, here, I want to give you some strengthening exercises. I want you to see the ENT. You have postural decompensation due to upper airway resistance. And because mm -hmm. your nose is blocked, your head's posturing forward. Yep. 
So start these exercises, see the ENT and come back and let me reevaluate. I, one yeah. thing on, I want to, uh, yeah. it's so funny you just said that with the, the nose being blocked and head forward. So there's a lot of literature substantiating exactly that and yeah. the excess of curvature of the C-spine. So um, I was just having a um, great conversation with, with Pat McBride, who's awesome with AAPMD. Mm -hmm. And I did a webinar with them uh, just recently on cleft cranial facial care and, and a kind of a new way to approach that. And she and I were having a great talk about some of the cool things that they're doing and, and uh, working together on some things. And, and we were talking about that and how, you know, the head position, a lot of times when I'll present, you'll look at a pre and a post cone beam, or like, let's say you make, you, you, you uh, do a construct into a 2d. So it kind of looks yeah, like yeah. SF, but either way, SF. you're looking at that lateral view at that point. And like a sagittal slice. And so you look and you, you know, the neck, and for those who are just listening audio, you can't kind of see us doing this, but we're like craning our necks a little bit and tipping our chins up. And the easiest way to think of it, and I heard this explained this way once, is it, and it was actually in an article, uh, CPR, it's like a CPR posture, right? Yeah. You're doing the chin head tilt, tilt head, chin head, head, head tilt, chin lift, and you're trying to essentially get some a, a patency to almost intubating yourself so you can get yeah. air down through the mouth because you're obstructed through the nasal passageways. And so I said to Pat, I said, I see all these kids, I, I, you know, looking through thousands of cases that I treated with, with cone beam, uh, pre and post had cone beam. And I would see in the beginning, they've got that crane neck and, you know, they're sitting and they're slouched and, and their head is craned back. And, and you know, we, would, as assistants, my assistants and clinical clinicians were trained, you get Frankfurt horizontal, you know, um, the uh, ear and the eye parallel with the floor, you know, you want Frankfurt horizontal parallel with the floor as best you can. We have a fixed point. They were staring in a mirror straight ahead across from them. We had a head strap. So we were trying to, you know, it wasn't like we were just letting the patient put their head wherever, but that was their natural head position, yeah. even if they were looking straight ahead. And then you look at the post-treatment image, right? After I've gone in and done my growth modification and, and, or they've seen the NT and allergist or, you know, we, we've essentially addressed all of the issues with their nasal breathing. They're now nose breathers. They're growing properly. They have good tongue space, all of those things. And their head posture is completely different. And the skeptics and the naysayers say, oh, no, no, you didn't actually improve airway. Look, I'm going to take two images on myself. One is with my head like this crane back. And one is like this. And look, I have a totally different airway. Correct. It is a snapshot in time and diagnosing an airway issue off of a static image is not anything we're saying that you can do predictably, but you can tell a ton of diagnostic information from that image. And the number of times I saw these kids hundreds of times that in the beginning had the head posture you were describing. And in yeah. the end, we're sitting nice and upright with this beautiful head posture. And I started saying, I mean, I said to Pat yesterday, I'm like, I don't know how many times I had to be hit over the head with it before I finally started saying, and the light bulb went off. Wait a minute. These kids are looking. They are, they do have the same head posture before yeah. and after relative to their Frankfurt horizontal, but they their their, their whole their whole skeletal complex has changed as a yeah. result of how they're breathing. So I, I just, again, that, because I had that conversation with her yesterday, I think that's something really important to get out there. And, and so what you're saying is the physician that's working with you is seeing this in adults yeah. who kind of have a chronic posture that that's been that way. And they're trying to address that and attributing it to their obstructed obstruction of their nasal passageways. And it, it's making his, his treatment more predictable and, um, and better outcomes. And mm. so it's, it's just cool seeing him absorb the literature, the, um, the dentists are putting out how it relates to, you know, his practice as a, you know, 40 year seasoned physician. Mm. Um, so he's a pathway that patients come in. Um, and then, um, our myofunctional therapist, she'll take direct referrals from orthodontists. And so if they're referred over by a doctor with records, they can get scheduled directly with her. Okay. So if an orthodontist is in treatment and recommends myofunctional therapy, direct referral to her. And, and I only need to be consulted if, um, you know, she's got a question, but she's pretty much on a text relationship with the orthodontists that send to her. So mm -hmm. she just talks to them and, you know, if a bracket wire is long, uh, yeah, I'll come in and snip it or, or put a gate back on or something like that. You know, of course mm -hmm. I'm going to help with that, but that's, that's pretty rare. Um, and then, um, Dr. Sahar, she's a, a, a dentist, but she is kind of our uh, pediatric guru. So she's seen infants with tongue tie, lip tie, doing early orthopedic development, managing the sleep disorder breathing. We do a sleep study on every kid before we start any treatment. So interesting. So do, you, okay. Interesting. So what happens? What, um, what's the thought process on that? So I, I don't want to compete 
with the orthodontists or I don't want them to think I'm doing what they do. Mm -hmm. And so we're not, no, no orthodontist is, um, doing validating if there's a sleep disorder breathing. So I'm, we're treating pediatric sleep breathing disorders. We're not treating orthodontics. Mm -hmm. So we want to develop the arches if needed, normalize the breathing, get nasal patency, get them to an ENT, get them to an allergist, improve their food. Um, look at that. And then if the teeth just need rotated and aligned, but they're generally in the right spot, that's what every, and that's what most orthodontists love to do re really, really great at. Mm -hmm. and so if we can tee the case up, um, control the etiology, get some development and then get them to the orthodontist at eight or 12, right. Then great. They're, yep. they're they get to do what they excel at. Um, and you can't, you can't see in a hundred patients a day, you cannot talk about all this stuff. You, That's you part of the problem. Yep. You can't have a 15 minute conversation with mom about John's headache and his sleep hygiene and his excessive video game playing or this or that, like mm -hmm. you, you don't even want to talk. You can't even talk to the parent. It's like, you know, parents sit over here, mm -hmm. kids come here mm -hmm. and we roll around and, and, um, and that's, that's actually great. You, you, you can serve and help a ton of people. And there's some great orthodontists, the ones that I work with, they got an impeccable screening protocol where they're catching those kids and they're yep. like, you know, one of them even is, is want to say, Hey, I can tell you, you need braces and you're going to pay thousand dollars a day and you'd gladly sign up. And I'd put brackets on, I think we need to wait. Mm -hmm. We got to get this fixed and I'm going to be here to help your kid. We just got other problems. And that like that bluntness to a mom is like, yeah, I know. I called three other offices that could get me in today. Yep. And it's like, yeah. And they'll probably put braces on today. I just don't think that's right for your kid. So yep. I'm not going to do it. Yep. And I say that with appliances all the time. People are like, I want an appliance. And I'm like, you can call five offices and they'll get you on today. We need to do a sleep study. We need to see an ENT and we need to do this before mm -hmm. we talk about plastic in the mouth. And the sleep so study, just the, the reason I was asking more is I found, and again, it's so weird. Like you saw that one patient that yesterday, I was talking to Pat about that. And then this with the residents yeah. yesterday. So I was talking to them about it and my philosophy, which is again, why I love having these conversations because we do it differently. And I, I learned too, but I, I found in the area I was practicing, the logistics of people getting a sleep study that was reliable was challenging. Um, they didn't want to go to as necessarily to a sleep lab. Uh, parents spend a night, you know, all of these other challenges there, cost, insurance, whether they covered it or not. Uh, and then the um, overall sort of data that would be the information that'd be gleaned from it because of, as you know, with Christian Gimmon, you, you there's a lot of information on the scale and how they developed the pediatric scale and being that they extrapolated the adult data. There's not really a scale. So AHI to me for a kiddo, I always looked at it as I can detect when there are signs and symptoms of sleep disorder breathing through a PSQ, a pediatric sleep questionnaire or whatever, you know, people yeah. want to use for those fair six and, um, and, and get that inf information. I could tell with my cone beam, if there was nasal passageway obstruction and or lymphoid tissue obstruction, uh -huh. oral pharyngeal constriction, lack of tongue space, lack of tongue mobility, uh, narrow arch. So all of those things. So I always took the approach of and I just said this to residents, I'm not opposed to them getting a sleep study. And there were certain extreme cases where they didn't have any narrowness or transverse deficiency of the arches and were having, didn't have any overt noticeable things. They'd seen the ENT, they'd seen maybe the allergist, and they still were having these sleep problems. And then we'd want to get the sleep physicians involved. But for the standard sort of younger, you know, say six, seven year old kid that came in, if I detected all those things, I would say to the parents, you, yes, you may need to you know, I refer to the allergist, the NT as needed, uh, if it was one of their things in their arena. And then I would say, let's go in and help grow the arches and develop everything, get at that, you know, the cause of why you're having these problems. I'll do my part. And I want to be very clear if they were broad, I'm not one that's like, you just go expand these broad patients because expansion is the whole end all be all to airway. No, but the, if they're narrow and deficient, you treat the etiology, you, you perform evidence-based treatment. And mm -hmm. what's our evidence-based treatment for transverse deficiency expansion. So however you want to do that, I did it with braces and wires when young kids, I know people I used to do it with expanders and went to braces and wires years back. And again, I don't, everyone has different ways and that's totally fine. But I found that when I went in on those kids and it worked such a high percentage of the time, if I involved my medical colleagues and I mm -hmm. did what I was doing and then if they needed speech involved, however, that was playing in. Um, which unfortunately there wasn't at that time really any myofunctional therapy in my area. Uh, so sadly, I didn't take advantage of that as much as I, I should should have could have um, had there been that. But um, 
I would then say if at the end we were still struggling, like even nine, 10 months into treatment, like, like, no, I'm not like they're still snoring, which rarely ever happened. But, uh, I would say, you know, okay, now we've got to dig a little deeper into this because mm-hmm. I, you know, now, you know, you've seen the ENT, you've seen the allergist, I've made the arches wider and, and normalized. There's plenty of room for the tongue. Uh, you know, now let's try to figure out what, it, cause as we know, sleep disorder, breathing, obstructive apnea is, is a very multifactorial, multifaceted yeah. uh, disease. So, um, that was more my approach. So again, I was just asking yeah. because it's just, and I, I, again, I, I'm not saying mine's right. Yours, right. I just, I found it in my world, it was difficult to kind of yeah get the pediatricians and get everyone on board to get these sleep studies. So I just started saying, well, let's kids suffer. And that I kind of just evolved into that. So I don't know what your yeah. thoughts are. And on, yeah. Ideal is an in-lab PSG with uh, end title CO2. That's mm-hmm. ideal. It's the gold standard. Mm-hmm. Our labs are booked out eight months. And, and so right, yeah. another problem. Yep. A good, so, good point. Yeah. So what we did is we invested in a, a, you know, an FDA approved home sleep test for kids. Oh, cool. Okay. And it's called the sleep image ring. Um, yep. The watch pad one works for anybody uh, over 60 pounds. And we have um scored and interpreted by a board certified sleep physician that we work with. Dr. Interesting. Rob. Okay. So, so I misunderstood. So you're, they're not going into a sleep lab. No. Yeah. Got, now I'm getting test. it. Okay. Got it. Hey, everybody, be sure to check out the doc website where you can get access to tons of great information, including free educational content, access to private one-on-one coaching with me, ADA SERP recognized CE courses, and amazing patient testimonials. Just go to the orthocoach.com. That's the orthocoach.com. And now back to today's episode. Okay. And, and Dr. Rama will, will say, Hey, we got to get this kid into a lab. Here's why. But we just want data points. And, Got it. And, and then we can quantify heart rate variability, depth of sleep, and and just have data points as we start sure. the case. Well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. No, that but then that, we yep. can we can say, hey, we need it, we think we want an in-lab too. But if there's craniofacial symptoms that are in our scope, we we start treatment just like you did. You got reason to start. Right. And and let's improve what we can. Dr. Boyd says it well. I want to make sure that muscle function and skeletal development is not negatively impacting your child's sleep behavior and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if you give me the baton on that, I'll make sure that's not it. Cause you know, kids obviously could still have sleep issues totally related to that, but let's, let's take malocclusion, skeletal development, breathing. Let's take that out of the equation. So it's not, it's, it's not a contributing factor. And why do you think so many orthodontists, I completely agree with that. Why do so many, what, seeing that you come at it from a little different angle, being general practitioner who didn't go through these years of being kind of, well, it's, I go the, the, the sort of dogmas that get enforced on us in our, in our or formal education a, is, is, you know, it's different. So we, co- why do so many of us, do you think come out of training and in, in the orthodontist you've met and encountered, have you gotten a feel for why so many are resistant to exactly what you just said and what Kevin says, which to me makes complete yeah, and total sense. I mean, I think it's, you, you work your butt off to get to school. You work your butt off in school. You got a crazy amount of debt. And you make, I mean, dentistry is one of the, it's kind of crazy. You, you can kind of suck as a dentist and still make $200,000. Like there's not many industries where you're, you you might not be the best clinician. You might not be the best communicator, but you can still take home Mm $200,000. So I I think it's hard work. It's extra work. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be looked at differently. Mm -hmm. You're going to have uphill battles. Your prices are going to be higher. You're going to have more education. And then you're going to have to spend more time talking, less time doing. And you just went four for four, by the way, on, on all things I had to do. Yeah. It's the four things you just listed. I had to do by practicing my practice. Yeah. You're right. It's hard work. You get some arrows in the back. Uh, But you know, I, I think we need orthodontists to be, you know, I, I say it you might be listened. You might hear it. Big deal. You hear a practicing orthodontist, show it and do it. Um, then that, that speaks volumes to other orthos. Um, you know, yeah, I, but they still fight it. Too. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they, they man, fight too. Now, a lot of no, them are, like, wow. a lot of them are protecting the end. They think they're protecting the industry. Yeah, I think so. Protecting what the Godfather said, but like, you know, the recent AO lecture, um, I saw, I can't remember what doctor it was. I have his slides. Um, he gave them to everybody. It said, never expand in the name of airway, only if there's a posterior cross fight. Mm-hmm. 
you know, never and only are maybe terms that <laughs> don't belong in protocols because yeah. never and never and only. I, I, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but, but again, you mean to tell me if, if, you know, this is the width of the upper arch, this is the width of the lower arch, upper, lower, don't expand. Okay. Lower, upper, expand. Well, what if upper's here and lower's here? That's worse than the cross bite. Right. And that's exactly what I, what I say so, again, for those on audio, it's weird. Daniel's showing the width of, you know, being that we, we basically this, the, the concept that we're taught. And literally this also came up when I was lecturing the residents yesterday that we are, they, we are taught the patient has a wider mand mandibular arch, right. And a narrow maxilla such that there is a posterior crossbite. We have no qualms. In fact, it is completely the norm and accepted to say that patient needs early orthodontic intervention to address the crossbite, even if there's no functional shift. Because a functional shift, you could say, okay, they're going to cause you know, aberrant growth of the jaw and leads to TMD. But even if there's no shift, even if it's just a, a unilateral, bilateral crossbite with no shift due to a deficient maxilla, you take that same patient and you cave their lower arch in right? We're not saying they have a narrow mandible. It's rarely the case. It's typically the mandibular arch compensates to this narrow maxilla, caves in, steep curve of Wilson, insufficient tongue space. That same patient comes in and in, I can almost guarantee you in that patient, you're going to see at least moderate anterior crowding in that kid because yeah. arch width, obviously when it's constricted, you get uh, less arch perimeter. We say, you, you, you watch that patient, you, you, th this watchful waiting and you watch them grow and you do growth of observation. I cannot for the life of me understand that patient B who has no posterior crossbite has a more severe malocclusion than patient A. Exactly what you're just saying. Yet, like we argue about this. And then there's people who say you can't expand the mandibular arch. I'm like in the sixties when Schwartz and Gratzinger were doing all their studies. And I mean, McNamara, who's been sort of mainline academics, but done a great job yeah. of kind of bridging that gap and being willing to step outside of the norms a little bit on this stuff. He's proven the, the extra benefit you can get an upper expansion if you do the lower as well. So the people who say you can't expand a lower arch, we're not talking about expanding a mandible, right? We get that that would require surgery and extraction osteogenesis, but expanding a lower arch. So I completely agree with you on that. Um, but again, why do people, do you have orthodontists who give you rationale for that? I mean, when you say that to them and you have that discussion, because you, again, you come at it at a different point from me. I'm one of them. I'm in that uh, I have a little different viewpoint having gone through the training. When you who understand it so well have an orthodontic specialist tell you otherwise, how do you respond? And what's their reaction when you tell when you when you try to explain or educate them? Um, you know, it depends on the on the patient, but there there some docs have said, you know, if I don't have my academy support due to liability, I'm not going to treat outside of the scope of their recommendations. Interesting. I and hadn't heard that before. That's interesting. Okay. That's sad because of the litigious society we're in now. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Like I'm, I'm not willing to stick my head out there. Um, go ahead, Dr. Clower, you can manage the MSE expansion, mm -hmm. but until the AAO has a protocol for MSE expansion, we're, we're staying away from it. And it's like, okay, you know, but Interesting. You know, every, every, everything's got to be vetted before it becomes law and protocol, um, unless you're a drug, but, um, <laughs> you know, that would be you know, on about that. Yeah, right. But, yeah. You know, the, the way it historically worked was practicing physicians and dentists have a license to treat. They got to have safety in mind they got to do what's best what worked at the office and on patients was validated and we got good clinical outcomes then we took that to the university mm -hmm. and we said hey we need to study this and quantify it mm -hmm. okay what did you learn this all right great we're going to study it and quantify it and the researchers do their things mm -hmm. hey doc here's the study makeup will you test it yep okay hey powers that be here's the protocol it's worked. Mm -hmm. Let's deploy it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What's happened. It's been the flip side. Drug companies, procedure companies, they create what they think is best. They create their own study that has a bunch of flaws and biases. Mm -hmm. And then they tell the doctors what to do. Mm -hmm. um, There's a little virus that went around in 2020 that that happened, right? Mm -hmm. they, I hadn't heard they, about that one. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was <laughs> and it, granted who it was, that was weird, man. I grant grace to everybody in there, but what they they didn't give the doctors the ability to be doctors. Yep. 
Um, they didn't talk about hydration, vitamin D and all that. And doctors were just sitting on the sidelines being told, wait, 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 we'll tell you what to do. Yeah. Old school, it should have been small think tanks of, hey, right. what did you see? Oh, I saw right. this. Oh, they responded to vitamin D. Yeah. I did a bolus of that and see, and oh man, she turned the corner. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And and you share and you compare notes. Yeah. And 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 that's really how this, that's what's happening now in this world is, mm. is docs are sharing, comparing notes, always trying to be as safe as possible. Yep. We got to push the envelope a little bit. Otherwise, nothing's ever going to change. Mm. So we can't wait till the protocols get vetted and established. I mean, that's that's going to take forever, but we have to be mindful. We have to be, we have to communicate and we have to learn from each other and we got to own up to our mistakes. And, you know, I do things very differently than than I did before. And um, Right. And that's okay. And I, I don't know why yeah, we, like, where has it happened in doctoring that all of a sudden we're, we should be indicted for the way we practiced 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we didn't know better or do better. And yeah. I do think there's concerns out there about liability from these organizations that, well, who knows what's going to happen? Well, how about you just own it and say, we're evolving. It's called practice. As we've said, you know, yeah, I read yeah, a great yeah. one, great line in that in our podcast, but it's, we're evolving. We're growing. It's yeah. okay to admit we didn't do it right. It's okay to admit that we are learning how to do this better. What I disagree with is when they sit up there and say, and I even agree with you too, that when you have the person who's just doesn't feel comfortable doing that, I'm not yeah. saying that person needs to, right? Like we all have yeah. to practice where we're comfortable. Where I draw the line is um, the people who go out and actively oppose, uh, actively speak uh, in opposition of it, right? Like anybody doing that is performing outside the scope and they start to, to, to spread yeah. that fear and intimidate other people. Because at the end of the day, as you probably know well about the AA, the ADA's 2017 position statement, yeah, that yeah. Steve Carson's in help draft and it's awesome. And I reference it many times, but uh, it is, it talks about that our job is to recognize, you know, screen every patient for sleep related sleep disordered breathing, they say SRBD, sleep related breathing disorders, yeah. uh, and, and detect them, uh, which they define as sleep disordered breathing, upper airway resistance syndrome, and obstructive sleep apnea, screen all patients for that R work and refer to work with and refer to our medical colleagues as needed, and then perform evidence based dental orthodontic treatment to address it. And I would challenge anybody who says we shouldn't be expanding on patients with a transverse deficiency, upper and lower arches when they're young, tell me where normalizing the transverse of a patient who's growing with a deficiency is not evidence-based. Show yeah. me, prove it to me. I've yeah. yet to have anybody who can do that. Prove it. And then if I, so now if I'm doing that and I'm finding out that I'm helping them breathe better on top of that, as a side effect of that, how, am, and I'm using a cone beam to evaluate the nasal passageways and airway and referring with my medical colleagues I would contend I'm the one practicing within the guidelines and the recommendations. And those who bury their heads in the sand are actually not, you know, so I could make the for both cases. So I agree with you. I think there's a lot of intimidation. I think they've got, and that's why a lot of these sort of mouthpieces come out and they're so vocal against this because they yeah. know it works and it intimidates people. Well, and there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of egos, um, in, in the industry and, um, and, you know, we all have to be self-aware of, you know, that we don't fall into that trap. And what, what the, the saying is, um, um, oh, I might mess it up, but you can have an opinion, but don't let your opinion be you. Mm. And it's one of those, like your opinion can change. Um, and uh, the scariest thing is when um, someone is not willing to hear another person's perspective mm -hmm. um, and admit to being wrong. And mm -hmm. that's probably the coolest thing is when someone admits to being wrong i was i was listening to a uh, um a podcast and the interviewer said hey you had uh you had criticized so and so um i've never seen that of this person and they explained and he goes you know what i think i just saw a sound bite and i made a gross assumption if that's your experience serve this as an apology to mike i misheard you and understood you it sounds like we have more in agreement than i would have thought mm -hmm. and like that was just cool like yeah. that's how it should go and we all can be wrong I I, I I i specifically remember um talking to a mom about phase one treatments unnecessary because my mentor told me it's overkill and he told me i didn't refer to this doctor in town he did phase one on everyone and that's unnecessary and so i just repeated that mm -hmm. and 
now I look back and I'm like, that kid's probably a patient of mine. Mm. And I'm like, oh, that's my fault. Mm-hmm. And so I, I tell parents like, you know, I was taught that. And so yep. I told people that and I look back, I'm like, what an idiot, mm. you know, but. But and it's know. okay. And that's okay. Like that. Yeah, that's what know, I was like, well, we don't know. why not grant ourselves and our colleagues a little grace? Right. Yeah. I mean, ultimately like it's why we yeah. all did think, do things differently. Um, and it, and I think we need to show each other some more worried, respect for that. If you're worried about the litig- litigious nature of it, talk to any attorney. Um, you know, patients don't come after you when something goes wrong. They come after you when something goes wrong and you don't respond appropriately you don't inform, you don't show empathy. And what's sad is the moment a patient gripes, your malpractice insurance company says, stop talking to them. Yep. And so that just looks bad to start. I just had a recent case. It's, it's sad, but a specialist, um, you know, stuff's happening. And the patient said to me, like, I'm only doing this because it, it, they didn't show they cared. They weren't willing to talk Mm. and hear me out. And, and I just, I just didn't feel that. And so here I am. And, and, um, and so it's a nice reminder to me of like, communicate well, show empathy, admit if something went wrong, that that's not what you wanted. Um, and, And, you know, gross negligence is gross negligence, but every single day, every single day, a patient says, my jaw's been clicking since I had ortho. And my jaw's been clicking since my wisdom teeth. A lot of people's jaws start clicking in their teenage years. And guess what? Everybody has ortho and everybody has wisdom teeth out. Mm. So a lot of my day is spent supporting, justifying, explaining that it wasn't the surgeon. It wasn't the orthodontist that caused your problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they have this bent up anger about it. And some are even mad because the orthodontist or the oral surgeon was never willing to engage in the conversation about Mm. is this related or is it not? Mm -hmm. I usually say, hey, I totally get why you think it's related. But guess what? Dr. Anderson, he takes out the hundreds and thousands of wisdom teeth. And I don't get a lot of patients from him that he's caused jaw problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just situational. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But then some people are real aggressive is they won't even let me come in for an eval because they said it's not related. But you just got to listen to the patient and hear them out. and, and, um, And you can smooth over most situations. Yeah, and I could make a case for... You know, if you if people want to really kind of take the stance that hey, look, by 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 doing something on these patients, you are uh, committing malpractice or opening yourself up to liability. Technically, if negligence is the case, right? And if you, well, I think another big reason there's a lot of, of lawsuits and malpractice lawsuits is, is something was missed, right? Misdiagnosis, yeah, yeah. misrecognition, or uh, put the patient off. Like, no, we're just going to watch you for now. And next thing you know, you have some you know, le- lesion that you thought was benign that has grown into something that is not. So that's where that, and I think, and I'm not equating what we're doing to, to cancer or anything terminal. I'm just saying the overall, the you know, overall impact that sleep disordered breathing has on the on the quality of life and the longevity of someone's life is known and well documented, right? Yeah. We know people who don't breathe well have a lower quality of life, have many more health issues and comorbidities and shorter lifespans. Why aren't our organizations looking at that and saying, hey, look, orthodontists, dentists, you guys and gals can play a role in this. And if you're not screening for this, if you're not trying to figure this out, now you have liability and culpability. Because yeah. you're missing something that could help this patient. And by sticking your head in the sand and saying, this isn't ever the way we're done it. And there's not enough research and, and all of these other things that you're trying to, you know, the kind of that pearl clutching, I call it onto the reason why to take a stance against this. Why don't we flip the table and say, you know what? No, there's liability on you for not yeah. taking the time to take, taking the time with your patient, diagnose your patient, figure this out. And I'm not saying you have to treat it, right? Like if you're not comfortable, a lot of orthos just aren't comfortable treating six, seven year old kids. And I know that surprises some people, but we're not trained to do that. We don't do that a lot in our residencies. So uh, they're just not comfortable. That's okay. But that doesn't give you an excuse to not recognize it and then send it to one of your colleagues who does feel comfortable with that. The ortho office isn't set up for it. It Open seven chair bay bay with exposure to a five-year-old having emotions mm. is going to shame the kid, yep. you know, like, yep. so you can't put a five-year-old in the middle of seven chairs yep. and have all the noises and the music and yep. the girls dropping trays and bringing around like a little kid's going to just yep. be out of sorts. So the, the, tr- the, the ideal ortho office isn't, isn't set up. So that's like a great our, point. Yeah. Part back to our process when they come in, you know, it's a private closed door room. 
we do a, a consultation, we intake what their chief complaint is, and then we order whatever images and x-rays and pictures that we want. Mm -hmm. We discuss treatment options and then who's on the treatment team and, you know, whether they need an orthotic for their TMJ, they need PRF injections, laser therapy, PT, ear, nose, and throat referral, um, referral to ortho, endo, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll, we'll walk them through that journey and connect with the patient and figure out what it is they want achieved, what success looks like for them. Mm -hmm. And then we tell them what we think is possible and manage expectations along the way. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's been fun. Um, I think we're getting better. I mean, I, I hosted a lecture in 2017 locally, right when that paper came out and, um, the ADA paper, yeah, the ADA. Yeah. yeah. We got together a bunch of people and, you know, it's, it's gotten better in our area. A lot of people are dabbling in it now and it, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, and I want more to dabble in it. Um, and I want more offices to treat it. So mm -hmm. I I'll have offices over, I'll teach them how to take a bite that we take. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll teach them what lab we use. I'll, I'll console on cases and they might send me some patients here and there, but like there's plenty to go around and I, I really don't care. I just care that they're doing it right. Yep. So if someone goes to a course of a technique that I think is antiquated, I'll tell them and I'll be like, come on, Alpha, shadow me. Like, would you care? It's like, oh, I'd rather you be doing it the right way mm -hmm. or a better way than to be doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll bail them out, um, help them out. And it's it really no different than a genuine endodontist. Like, I'll teach you how to do eight, nine, just operate it well, clean it well, and don't make it a headache for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, come on over. Let me see this. Here's why you'd want a scope. You know, you think number 14, people think, oh, you deal with all the crazy patients. Um, and, you know, think about doing a root canal on number 14 with limited opening and the canals are sclerosing. If you got a scope and you're comfortable doing it and you got a great assistant, not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have a good light, you don't have magnification, your assistant's never assisted, that's a miserable process. Mm -hmm. So pick and choose your battles. Um, my, you know, seeing a suicidal patient or seeing a patient going through some tough stuff and is maybe you know, is has a lot of emotions. Like that's not a big deal when you got a compassionate team and a system in time to do that. You throw that in the middle of your orthodontic day with a hundred patients. Well, right, right. The, so yeah. you know, we just got to pick and choose our battles, know what we're comfortable treating, like treating, but we can't be ignorant to the obvious things that are out there. Yeah. Well, I give you a ton of credit for what you're doing. And I'm not just saying that, I, you know, I, I love trying to, I love having people on the show and trying to pick the brains of people who are visionaries, thinkers outside the box, doing things differently, because I think when people see it, they don't know inside. I love the podcast format for a lot of reasons, but they, people today got a bit of a glimpse inside your, your head and your mind yeah. and your heart of where you're at with this. And there's probably a lot of people who hear, oh, someone you know, they're specializing in, you know, TMJ and you know, TMD and sleep. And it, 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 there's a, you went through a journey and a process to yeah. get there and you have the patient in mind and at heart. And that's all that should matter to any of us in all yeah. of this, right? Isn't that why we're doing this? Like yeah. if we're helping the patient, if we can argue about, again, the technique or the exact philosophy and when you start malfunctional therapy, it, fine, right? Like, but at yeah. the end of the day, you are trying to do things and expand the profession. It took a heck of a lot of risk to do it. You know, I mean, yeah, employing sure a myofunctional therapist and a physician, and, and you know, you got it's, it's, you know, we're not trained to do just for, I have a lot of patients and parents that listen to this and we're not trained to do any of that in school. So what Dr. Yeah. Clower's doing isn't like, there's no formula for that. So you went out of your way to do this. You went through COVID doing it uh, and, and you're doing something that is really admirable and, and, and whether or not people agree or want to do it, that's fine. But, but looking at how you became where you are and the type of, um, services you're offering your patients is just, it's awesome. And I think it's going to continue. I think your model, like you're starting, we're going to see more and more of those over yeah. the coming years popping up because For sure. uh, it, it, especially with kind of bring this full circle where medicine is going and has been for a little while, like something you're offering is just something patients are, are craving and we don't know, they don't know where to get it. And, and you're doing a tremendous service. So um, I, I thank you for that. And yeah. And uh, I appreciate it. And, you know, in closing, I'd say, if there's anybody listening to this um, with the intention of picking out what's wrong or bad, I know people will do that. They'll see a name on a podcast and they'll be like, I'm going to find something that's wrong. Mm. 
great, call me. Like get mm -hmm. on a Zoom. If there's something I said that was offensive, wrong, or maybe misrepresented, explain your perspective to me mm -hmm. and let's see if there's truth to it. If there is, I'll, I'll stand corrected and restate. But if there isn't, you know, what, what's your, what's your prejudice about it? Um, because I know a lot of people will do that. They kind of troll on a podcast trying mm -hmm. to prove a point wrong. And if you find one, great, let's talk, let's have a conversation. So I'm always open to having that, but a lot of people aren't comfortable having a um, confrontational discussion. And I don't yeah. look at it as confrontation. I look at it as like healthy debate and yeah. that's how we progress as a society. Yes. Right now, we're we're kind of being told we have these ideological groups and we're being told to only associate people that are uh, agree with us from a political sexual uh health care like oh we can only talk to these it's like no that's foolish like right we gotta, we gotta communicate with each other the world can't exist in these little silos, silos. yeah <laughs> so <laughs> As, yep. same thing is right in dentistry so um, yep. i appreciate the opportunity to be on um and uh Keep up the great work. I think you're providing immense value for practitioners out there um, and, uh, you know, happy to be a part of it. No, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the kind words and um, taking the time to come on and, and go into detail on this and be so open and have such an open conversation. And I love that you said, let's hop on a call or on a Zoom versus, you know, email me or let's, I mean, email's fine. You, yeah, can, you can have yeah. a lot, but but let, you didn't say, you know, let's go back and forth on a, on a Facebook post. You know, I think that's yeah, part yeah. of where we get so siloed, right? We sit behind our keyboards and all of our emotions pour into it. And there's something to be said for sitting down face to face and being able to have these discussions and conversations with one another. Um, yeah. And I have found that rarely does it devolve. It may get heated at times. If someone reaches out to you, you're having conversations. I have plenty of people who disagree with a lot of my platform and what I do, but I find when I sit down and have a conversation with them, either on zoom, even over the phone, you can really, like you said, find common ground, agree to disagree on things. It devolves when it's, social media and everyone's hurling insults and you don't have to own it. Um, so I love that you said, you know, call me or, or, yeah. or, or, or yeah. message me. So you, is, if someone wants to get in touch with you, cause I want to be putting your cell phone out there all over. Do you want to just yeah. give me your email and they yeah, can get my email is fine. And yeah, then you guys could set up a time to coordinate. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Clower, D R K L A U E R at T M J sleep, Indiana.com Indiana spelt out. Okay. Um, so Dr. Clower at tmjsleepindia.com or get in touch with Mike and he'll connect us. Great. Yeah. And thanks again for the offer on the book. That's super kind yeah. of you. I didn't know. Yeah. Just let me know and we'll, we'll get them stepped out to you. Appreciate that. And I'll put your email in the show notes too, um, as Perfect. well as uh, uh, the information awesome. about the book. So Dr. Daniel Clower, been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks so much for the time. And, and My pleasure, you. Mike. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to ADA SERP recognized CE courses or to schedule a private one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. And remember to join the Doc community on Facebook for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Facebook, search for the Doc community and request admission into the group. You can also find Doc on Instagram at at theorthocoach. And always remember, you have been blessed with the ability to do amazing things.